that give presentations here. I'm not a PowerPoint person. I still have a personal <laughs> slide projector and use a lot of slides for historical talks. I've got quite a number of photographs of Crane and the house that I'm going to be passing around during the course of the talk here this afternoon. First and foremost, let me introduce you to the man of the hour, Frederick Stolp Crane. His middle name, Stolp, was his mother's maiden name. He was born in June of 1833 in Wayne County, New York, where exactly that is in the state, I do not know, can't really tell you. He lived until 1915 when he died at the age of 82 in Long Beach, California. I have a lot more to say about his, uh, his history. His parents, David and Catherine Stolp Crane, were farmers, pure and simple. They arrived in Illinois in 1835 when Frederick was just two years old, supposedly according to one uh, biographical history of him, they came in a two-horse wagon from New York State, settling in what is now DuPage County. When he died in 1915, just a short time after the, his 82nd birthday, he, his remains were returned to DeKalb County for burial in Ohio Grove Cemetery on uh, Barbara Green Road between Salmonock Road and Airport Road. His father acquired a sizable farm apparently in DuPage County when the family arrived here in 1835 and uh, raised Frederick to follow in his footsteps as a farmer. Frederick did that until uh, 1869 when he saw fit to leave DuPage County and come to DeKalb County. His father, though, had died in 1849 when Frederick was only 16 years old. But Frederick continued apparently to farm his father's farm until he decided to come further west to DeKalb. Don't know exactly when the photograph of him was taken. He looks to be a senior citizen, of course, and so we can probably assume it was uh, uh, maybe 1910 to 1915 during the last years of his life. When he first settled in DeKalb County, he acquired 223.95 acres of land along Airport Road between Pleasant Street Road and Barber Green Road from Elias and Elmira Hartman, who were early farmers of Cortland Township. He is said to have paid $4,643.75 for that land and took out a mortgage to finance the purchase of it. The house that he built was illustrated in the 1871 combination atlas map of DeKalb County, Illinois, the county plat book issued that year. It was a simple two-story front gabled house, not very pretentious looking at all. Actually, the big barn over here at the edge of the illustration looks more impressive than the house did at that time. The house was built in 1869 within a year of uh, the time that uh, Frederick settled in DeKalb County. Already by the time of the 1870 U.S. Census, the property was valued at $13,625, just a year after Frederick arrived here, built the house and the original outbuildings on the property. The house, though, from every indication, was destroyed by fire sometime in 1879, about 10 years after it was originally constructed. Frederick then, according to a Sigmar True Republican article from March of 1880, had already started construction on its replacement, which is the very pretentious house that's shown on the front of the podium here. And I'll have better pictures of the house to, sh to pass around for you to look at as, uh, as we go here. In 1855, before 
Frederick came to DeKalb County. He got married in Naperville to a, to a woman named Mary Bristol. Their wedding taking place on December 20th, 1855. Mary and Frederick had five children, three sons, Hiram, Frank, and Myron, and two daughters, Nettie and Carrie. Carrie was the youngest of the children, born in 1869. And I believe she, as an adult, married a decalb individual by the name of Frank Patton, who also settled in Sycamore in the uh, late 1890s. Frank Patton uh, was a speculative builder for a long time in DeKalb, and it's according to one county history, he was responsible for constructing at least 225 different kinds of buildings uh, in the area. But in 1898, after Chauncey Elwood, one time mayor of Sycamore and Sycamore businessman and uh, the longtime Secretary and General Manager of the Sycamore Portland Railroad died in 1898, Frederick, uh, not Frederick, um, Frank Patton bought Chauncey's home at 827 Somerock Street in Sycamore, which still stands. The original portion of the house dates from 1859. And a large addition was added in 1869. The Sycamore Republican article of Mar in, in March of 1880 told that the framing of the house was to get underway very shortly thereafter. It's believed to be a solid brick house and gives every indication of of so being. This is a, an interesting undated winter photograph showing the property to, uh, to the right, Airport Road running north. As you look more closely at this picture, as I start to pass around, you'll see there are a couple of silos and an outbuilding or two in the yard behind the house. One question that was raised in our research about the house was, was it something that was designed by an architect or was it something that Crane found in an architectural pattern book of the time that uh, someone held, else had designed across Philly, a Chicago architect. One of the things for sale in the gift shop here is uh, Clint Cargyle's book, The Five Mile Spur Line, which deals with Sycamore's railroad history and the history of the train depot that is now the headquarters of the Cal County Community Foundation. And in his book, Clint considered there were four potential architects who might have been responsible for constructing that old train depot building back in 1880. Three of them were Chicago people, Gurdon, Gurdon Randall. Another possibility was John Ackerman and also George Garnsey, all Chicago architects who had done building in Sycamore over the years. There was also a fourth possibility that Clint indicated in, in his book, a man named James Shannon, who originally was, set, was a Sycamore-based builder who later moved to Batavia. The most recent revelation about the house that we've learned came from Rob Glover, the chief archivist at the Joyner History Room at the Cal County History Center. Just last month, while going through some other issues of the Sigmar True Republican, he came upon a clipping, apparently from 1881, that dealt with the construction of the house and actually named who the architect of the house was. I had always thought, based on architecture alone and circumstantial evidence that it had been John Ackerman, who had been the architect of the George Wilde House at 450 Salmonock Street in Sycamore. Turns out it was George Garnsey, the original architect of Elwood House, who, in, uh, who designed St. Peter's Church on Salmonock Street in Sycamore, which was built between 1877 and 1879 and also the Charles Boynton Mansion on North Main Street uh, in Sycamore, 307 North Main. 
that revelation really kind of blew our minds when we uh, when we learned about it. <coughs> that winter scene shows the house from the south elevation. Joe Warnick from the Chicago chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians, who among other people has done a lot of research with me on the Crane House and its architecture and history, believes that this facade was probably intended as the most impressive approach to the house by people. Yet, uh, as you can see on the, the front, <coughs> and in this picture, which is a head-on shot of the house, there's no sidewalk or driveway leading in front of the house to the little porch over here on the southwest corner. That porch, while the house itself is a very good example of Italianate style architecture, not unlike many of the homes on Salm Rocks, South Main, and DeKalb Avenue in Sycamore, it doesn't have a very pretentious porch of any type. Very teeny tiny little porch kind of stuck in and, uh, as a, a second thought, not really uh, the, the entrance you would consider a house like this would have. It's a very pretentious two-story brick house on a high limestone foundation with a low pitch here roof, wider overhanging eaves, darker brackets under the eaves, cornice uh, surrounding all four sides of the house, and the lintels over the windows are all very heavily incised with carving. <coughs> On the flip side of this picture is the north elevation, which shows a large wooden porch, which is probably a replacement for an earlier, more fancy porch, probably very similar to the little porch at the southwest corner. That big porch, though, according to a lot of people, was always intended as the primary entrance into the house. And from what we've learned from talking with a couple people associated with uh, Elmer Larson LLC during the years that they owned the house, that was the way into the house for everyone. Employees, visitors, business people, whatever. And apparently there never was a formal staircase of any kind inside the house. This is something that really blew my mind and the mind of Joe Ornick when we first learned that fact. Shortly, a short distance inside that big back porch was a completely enclosed stairway that simply led up to the second floor of the house. And it was also been referenced by a couple people familiar with the interior to what was called the big center room on first floor. We don't know what exactly that room was intended as originally, or even if it was really a centrally located space within the first floor of the house. <coughs> a little over a year ago, Jane Higgins and a couple of, the, of uh, other people from the Cal County History Center and I pulled onto the property one day in Jane's van and walked completely around the house several times. <coughs> it is now very heavily overgrown with shrubbery, as we'll see in later pictures. These historic views are believed to date from the 1930s and 1940s and are out of the Ritzman family collection at the Joiner History Room. At the very back of the house is a rather modern looking two-story wooden stairway that connects the first and second floors of the house. And just the other side of this bush is a very short stairway that descends down to the basement of the house. <coughs> That basement area was, to a great extent, unused and unfinished. A very small portion of the basement supposedly was finished off when Larson's
purchase the house for use as their office building in 1998. And supposedly there was a, an employee break room down at that level. Otherwise, there was the remnants of a one-time coal bin and uh, other service areas of, of one type or other in the basement that hadn't really seen you so a long time. <laughs> now again, according to that Sycamore True Republican article from March of 1880, the house was originally intended to cost $6,000, which for a simple farmhouse out in the country is an extraordinary amount of money even for that time. John Larson, who I believe is the fourth generation of the Larson family that owned the quarry operation that uh, came, uh, came to be started on the property around 1933, told me in a phone conversation I had with him, he's now a resident of Florida, their house has many small rooms, they have wide board floors, crown molding, there's a fair amount of woodwork, 10 foot high ceilings on the first floor, but over and above that is basically very plain and ordinary on the interior. No fancy windows to speak of. And as I said, there was no formal stairway. That small entry porch at the southwest corner during the years that Larson's had the house simply was occupied by photocopy equipment. <laughs> Frederick Crane continued to own the house and farm until 1894. In 1897, after July 16, 1897, his wife, Mary Crane, died uh, 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 just short of, thir of, of having been married to Frederick for 32 years, she suffered a bowel infection which caused her death. Her obituary, which appeared in the Sigmund True Republican, indicated her funeral was held at the home on Airport Road and was quite well attended by well-wishers and uh, friends. She was buried in Ohio Grove Cemetery Interestingly, though, her, by her obituary states she was buried in Ohio Grove. Frederick's obituary from 1915 says he was buried in Ohio Grove. But the book on Ohio Grove Cemetery that the Genealogical Society of DeKalb County did back in the 1980s has no listings for any members of the Crane family. That really threw me. Several times during the last year, I've talked with Cheryl Cookie Aldous, the longtime Cortland Town clerk, who told me that the keeper of the Ohio Grove Cemetery records is a woman from Sigmar named Inez Kenaway. I telephoned Mrs. Kenaway several months ago and spoke with her, and she said, oh yes, they're buried in the cemetery. And she told me exactly where she had, she, she's been the longtime keeper of the records and knows the cemetery like the palm of her hand. And said they're in the, East addition to the cemetery. I said, now where exactly is the east addition? She said, the original portion of the cemetery is on the hilltop. The east addition starts down the side of the hill to the east. And I think it was, was it this, this past October, Jane, that we found? Yeah. Well, we found the grave. It was Jane and, and Teresa Jacobson and Joe Warnick and I uh, drove out there looking for the grave. and. <coughs> It was exactly where I just kind of said it would be. <laughs> nice, big, prominent granite marker. And you could have seen the house from their grave, which is really kind of what we thought when we stood there and we looked for the house. You can see the house from where they're buried, which I think was probably planned. But Between 1868, <laughs> when Frederick bought his original 223 acres of land and the time he sold the property in 1894, he had acquired a total of 400 acres of land. According to the October 27th, 1894 DeKalb Chronicle, Crane sold the house and farm 
for $21,000 to Frederick Townsend of Sycamore, whose home on North Main Street is now the Paper Doll House Weekend B&B next to the, uh, the Resource Bank building, which is in the original Townsend garage or carriage house building from 1905. According to that October 1894 article, Crane intended to sell his personal property at auction and then spend the winter in California. Well, he did more than spend the winter in California. He spent the last 20 years of his life in California, <laughs> moving to Long Beach, which in the early 1900s has started to become quite a uh, tourist destination. <clears throat> Shortly after, well, about two years after his arrival in California, he remarried, where married a widow named Malvina Lord. Don't know anything about her. And Joe Hornet had contacted uh, either the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce or the Long Beach Historical Society some months ago, trying to get additional information on Frederick and his uh, years in Long Beach. And, wasn't able to come up with much of anything except for the fact that Frederick did take on a new career for himself, at least for a short period of time, if not longer, in real estate, which we find kind of, kind of interesting. During the 20 years that he lived in California, in Long Beach, Frederick lived in three different houses, none of which survive today. The uh, Long Beach Chamber of Commerce, the Long Beach Historical Society did send us pictures of where the houses were and all have been torn down and the area around them completely redeveloped for other purposes. One, as a matter of fact, is a parking lot today. Hmm. <laughs> when he died in June of 1915, uh, Sons Hiram and Myron survived their father, and daughter Carrie uh, Patton survived their father, as well as second wife to what now being a Lord Crane. The Joyner History Room, among other things dealing with the house, has in their collection the historic abstract of property for the house which traces the origins of the property back into the 1830s, is 120 pages long. Several months ago, Rob Glover, the chief archivist at the Joyner Room, made a complete copy for me of the abstract, which I did not bring along today. Tell us some things of historical interest, but not everything that we would really like to know about uh, Crane and and subsequently the Townsend family and their involvement with the house. Fred Townsend, though, in 1912, suffered a very serious financial debacle, which cost him a great deal of his personal fortune. And at that time, his brother-in-law, Elmer Boynton Sr., and his wife, Rose Boynton, started to become interested in the property, and their names first appear in the property abstract. And it was Elmer Sr.'s son, Elmer Boynton Jr., and his wife, Lillian, who operated the gift shop in the old family mansion at 307 North Main Street that many of you may uh, have remembered and, and known, who uh, lived in the house at one time. We don't know precisely how many different families lived in the house after the time of Frederick Crane. In 1897, Fred Townsend bought a gravel crusher and started small quarry operations on the property himself at that time. There having been large granite deposits found on the land. And granite back in those days was a good material for, for use in building roads. Mrs. Boynton, who I knew between 1973 and the time she left Sycamore in 1986, told me years ago that when she and her husband lived in the Crane House, before they moved to the family mansion to 307 North Main, there was a beautiful marble, gray marble fireplace in one of the first floor rooms of the house that they had stripped out and 
taken to the house on North Main Street in Sycamore, where it remains today more than 70 years later. These two color pictures that I'll pass around next, I took in 2002 when I was doing the articles uh, in the Chronicle that were published as the three book series, A Journey Through DeKalb County. This one shows the house head on with, again, that little inset porch and then the south facade. Both of these views were 20 years old, well before the time that it started to be overgrown. And when we all visited there in October 2021, this is what the south facade looked like at that time and still does today. The woman there in the uh, foreground is Jane Higgins. <laughs> Yeah. You're forever in history. <laughs> Standing in, in front of the house and shooting up toward the uh, the roof facing Airport Road, the cornice detail uh, and the brackets were very evident and nicely painted. Ken Anderson worked for the Larsons from 1998 until 2005 doing renovation and restoration work in the house. I got his name and phone number in South Carolina from Cookie Aldis at the Cortland Town Hall uh, back in, uh, I think, December of last year. I spent an hour on the telephone talking with him, and he talked my ear off, and I talked his ear off about <laughs> what the house was like. And he remembered <coughs> when Larson's used the house as their office building. Only the first floor was in regular use with that partial area in the basement. The second floor was totally unused, just storage. And the low pitch ship roof on the house is so low, there's very little headroom in the attic, from what he told me. But up in the attic years ago, he found a, an original pair of pocket doors that had been in the house somewhere. Exactly where, we've never been able to determine. The, the Larsons started their quarry operation on the 400 acre farm in 1933. According to John Larson down in Florida, until the 1990s, the family never actually owned the land. They simply rented it, apparently originally from the Boytons, but there's no reference to uh, to the Larsons in the abstract from the 1930s or later. The abstract con continued until sometime in 1959. <coughs> but John Larson, again, when I spoke to him earlier in the year, said that at one time, Elmer Larson LLC had five different quarries between Sycamore on the north and Joliet on the south. <coughs> but in 1998, they actually bought the 300 acres of the old crane farm and the house for $8,500 an acre, or a little over $2.5 million. Mike Larson, uh, the third generation of the family who is now a resident of Oakcrest, in 1998 had the idea of moving the house to Sycamore. He believed that there were so many HVAC and other physical improvements that needed to be made to the house, he didn't want to spend the money to do it. <coughs> but he apparently did proceed with the, you know, the notion of moving the house and found that just to move it from where it sits on Airport Road, about a half mile or so, south of Barber Green Road, up to Barber Green Road itself, would cost one million dollars. And it was still going to be five miles from Sycamore. They intended locating it on the east side of the 700 block of Samanoff Street, where the old Waterman Hall School for Girls, later the St. Albans School for Boys, had been located. But when they realized the multi-million dollar price tag involved, they said, Let's do some renovation on site. And as I said, they continued to use it until 2008 when they sold it as their office building. 
When Larson's bought the property, though, in 1998, they purchased it from people who were referred to as the Palm Sisters. I have no idea who they were or who the Palm family was or how long they had even owned the property. There's no mention of them in any of the county histories that uh, I've been able to examine. But according to John Larson, on March 7th, 2008, the quarry operation and the crane house were sold to Vulcan Materials Company of Birmingham, Alabama. Vulcan Materials in the last 14 and a half years has done absolutely nothing with either the quarry or the house. The house has sat deteriorating unoccupied ever since 2008 for every indication. When I spoke to Inez Kenaway about where in Ohio Road Cemetery the cranes are buried, she said, oh yes, I remember that house. It's such a shame. It's just sitting rotting away. Joe Warnick <laughs> contacted not only the local similar office of Vulcan Materials on Lloyd Road north of town, but also the corporate office of Vulcan Materials in Birmingham, Alabama, as well as March Acquisitions in Birmingham, Alabama, which pays the tax bill on the house. None of them have ever responded to any of the quarries we've made in hopes of getting inside the house so we can better preserve some record of what it was like historically. This is an interesting close-up view of one of the windows on the house with the very beautifully incised sewn lintel at the top. All of them have that feature. And if you look closely at those early black and white photos of the house, sometime apparently in the 1930s or 1940s, the original arched windows, which extended up to the top of the stone lintels, were removed and traditional rectangular windows installed in their place. <laughs> One thing about the quarry operation, uh, over the years when Larson's had the property, and they had it for 75 years from 1933 until 2008, they allowed interested fossil hunters free reign on exploring the quarry areas for fossils, many of which are said to date from the last ice age, over 14,000 years ago. Both Jane Higgins and her daughter Chrissy are familiar with the quarry. Chrissy, when she was a student at St. Mary's grade school in Sycamore, had her class visit the quarry, and the students were given small fossils. As keepsakes. Chrissy, you want to say a uh, word or two? Uh, yeah, I still have it. Um, I was in school. I had, we got to go because Jeff Larson was in my class, so that we got to go to that trip. It was pretty cool. We had her like deep in there, so it was pretty cool. Hmm. They actually took the kids down. Now, Jane had the, had the privilege several years ago of actually being taken down in the quarry by. Dan Larson, my Dan Larson, Larson, another of the fourth generation of the Larson family that owned the first game. Yeah. So, yeah, it, 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 the hard hat and the little, but it, it's like the incline to get down there is completely like this, but you can see the layers of basic history. And Mike still talks, and Dan both talk about um, the groups would come out from the from Burpee from Museum and from the, the um, Field Museum and they would bring out scientists and stuff to look because it was such a clear delineation of the historic eras, you know, the... the a little of Eastern DeKalb County prehistory has ever been studied to speak of, but Burpee Museum up, up in Rockford does apparently have some of the larger, more significant fossil remains from as well as the field museum. The field museum has field, field too. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and this is a, I don't know if you can see it on my phone. 
if you're on Facebook, uh, you know you're from Sycamore Group, posted this a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and there are current pictures of, my phone's small, but there are current pictures of, of the quarry. You know, because, you know. Anyway, but it's really cool as there's full of water at that bottom lowest level now, because it's been abandoned for, um, so not only the house, but the quarry are, is also sitting abandoned as well right now so but it was really interesting i how deep would you say the quarry is i don't know distances but there was there was a long time down there <laughs> well you couldn't walk down it it was a really steep incline and it went down a long way but yeah it was kind of cool i didn't don't think they usually i was uh collecting I went out there because the, the library was doing a whole program and Dan actually came to the program and helped present it and I was working at the library, this was 20 years ago, um, at the Sigma <coughs> Library and they brought fossils for anybody who came to the program as well, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And Larson's too, during the years they had the quarry operationers said to amass their own personal collection yeah. of fossil material Mike's got that they were really really proud to show. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I've got these pictures if anybody wants to. <laughs> or go on Facebook. How many of you subscribe to Corn Silk, the uh, quarterly publication of the DeKalb County History Center? Okay. Part one of a 15 page article that I wrote about the Crane House and Frederick Crane appeared in the October issue of Corn Silk. Part two is going to appear in about a month in the winter issue of Corn Silk. So a lot of what I've told you today and some other facts as well, you can uh, find in those. And there was also a, a good picture of the quarry that I had obtained through uh, Joe Ornick that showed the different layers of stratigraphy within the quarry, showing where different types of fossils were, were found over the years. I don't take complete credit for any of this research. Jane, Teresa Jacobson from the History Center, Rob Glover from the Joyner History Room, Joe Ornick from the Chicago Chapter of Society of Architectural Historians, Ken Anderson down in South Carolina, John Larson down in Florida, Cheryl Cookie Aldous, the Cookie, the uh, Cortland Town uh, clerk, and Inez Kenaway, the keeper of the Ohio Grove Cemetery Records are the many and varied sources that uh, have helped me with the research about this. We have never been able to get inside the Crane House. Joe Warnick and I especially would love to be able to, to better preserve for the future some, ref some record of what the interior of the house is like. We don't know what that big center room was or wasn't that was mentioned by people. Supposedly, according to some, after license took over the house as their office building was divided into smaller working spaces. We've never been in it. We don't know. If you have any comments or questions, I'd be glad to entertain them. If, uh, Jerry Hartman was um, part of the I'm very hard to hear it. Jerry Hartman, he was a farmer, he lived in that house. Oh, probably, I don't like probably 19. Back in, I think it was 1985, the Chronicle one time did a, a very interesting story with pictures about the Crane House. I clipped that article years ago since this, since I started researching the house with Joe Ornig and others, haven't been able to put my hands on that. I've talked with Rob Glover at the Joyner Room several times in hopes that they might have it in their files. We've never been able to turn it up. But I do remember that in 1985, that article mentioned that the Hartman family had the property at that time. And there's, it. there's still a Hartman family, I understand, that on the property immediately across the road from the Crane House. Well, the Hartmans farmed that whole area, but Jerry Hartman was the 
a father that has three kids that they've rented that house for two years. And he's still, uh, he's still alive. He's on Pleasant Street. I thank you all for bringing the elements today to come out and hear what I've had to say about the house. If you have any other questions, I'd be glad to talk to you individually or as a group. Thank you. for about 14 years now since both the materials took over the property. And it's out on Airport Road? Out at, well, it's actually on Boston Road, 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 Road,